Um, okay, so welcome everyone um, to this uh, talk from the uh, U.S. Asian Law Institute. I'm uh, Catherine Wilhelm, the Executive Director, and uh, I'm very pleased to introduce one of our visiting scholars this year, uh, Professor Masahiko Kinoshita from Kobe University Graduate School of Law. He's uh, editor of a popular series of constitutional law casebooks in Japan. He's a member of a number of advisory bodies to local and central government on constitutional law matters. And he's written a thought provoking paper that I think everybody should have received if you registered for this event. We were sharing the, um, sharing the, uh, the draft uh, that addresses some of the commonly heard assumptions about the Japanese Supreme Court. Um, which are that it is uh, not as effective or as aggressive or assertive um, as say the US Supreme Court or some standard of what a Supreme Court should be or a constitutional court should be and therefore somehow fall short. So um, what the order of, of our program will be that Masahiko will make some opening remarks, see us some slides to share. And then Rick Hills, who is one of our faculty advisors and our con law expert in residence it's going to start a conversation, asking some questions um, from the about the draft, and then I understand Sam that you have some thoughts prepared in advance as well. So, and then we'll just open it up and invite some comments and questions. So, okay. Oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Berham, for organizing this valuable opportunity today. And also, I'd like to thank you, uh, thank uh, U.S. Asia Institute uh, as the wonderful faculty and colleagues. So in, in particular, Professor Alonso gave me the uh, chance to learn how, how Japanese law is discussed in the United States. Perhaps not surprisingly, Japanese legal scholars know little about how Japanese law is introduced outside of Japan. Uh, perhaps it may be the same as the fact that uh, American academics uh, do not know how US law is introduced in Japan. Uh, in any case, uh, I can say with confidence that without the uh, U.S. Asia Institute, I would not have been able to progress this paper as far as it is. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all members of the uh, fantastic environment of U.S. Asia Institute. Thank you again. So, uh, so now for uh, as for my paper, I have several inspiration. First. Uh, Judge uh, Katsumi Chiba's book and writings, who was a uh, former outstanding Supreme Court Justice in Japan. I had met him personally several times, and I was exposed to uh, his thinking. Uh, recently, this word appeared in the, his words appeared in the Japanese newspaper, and I think they are the most revealing of Chiba's philosophy as a judge. So Chiba said, uh, constitutional scholars debate the theoretical correctness independent of existing opposition. However, uh, theoretical correctness alone does not mean that it should be immediately put into practice. Resistance to fundamental altering the status quo is not mere logical discourse. Even opposition stem from just a reluctance to uh, change the status quo uh, may yield significant uh, uh, registers. Uh, indeed, as Chiba's words indicate, Japanese courts have often issued decisions that appear conservative, compromising, and out of date. And this idea of emphasizing political strategy has been strongly criticized by Japanese constitutional scholars. And uh, frankly speaking, I also had a doubt about Ch uh, Judge uh, Chiba's view. Uh, however, uh, I came across an approach that uh, recently attracted attention in comparative constitutional law field. It includes an article written by Professor Isaac Rob, uh, who is, is here today. Uh, in, in these papers, they argue that uh, courts around the world are writing their decision with uh, strategic thinking and the rationale for such strategy in the face or in confront of the political branches especially the dominant political party. I wonder if what Chiba was saying is perhaps not unique, but rather something that courts around the world are trying to put into practice. Therefore, I decided to reanalyze the Japanese Supreme Court from the perspective of the uh, stra strategy. 
To understand the strategy of the Japanese Supreme Court, it is important to know the political situation in Japan. First, Japan has a so-called dominant party system since 1955, the Liberal Democratic Party, LDP, has been in power almost 94% of the time. So uh, second, and in Japan, the cabinet has power to, uh, to power to appoint the Supreme Court justices. As a result, almost all Supreme Court justices have been appointed by the LDP cabinet. This is a, a Japanese recent situation. All Supreme Court justices are appointed by the uh, LDP cabinet. So, so uh, in other words, the majority of the diet is dominated by the LDP, and the cabinet is also honed by the LDP leaders, and the court are appointed by the LDP uh, cabinet. Legislative, executive, and judicial power all are LDP. But, uh, however, uh, there is a, a paradox here. Uh, despite such political situation, Japan holds a uh, fair and competitive election and has freedom of speech and other uh, fundamental rights. Uh, Japan is the most politically free country in the, for example, index at Freedom House. Uh, however, this is not necessarily case in the most country with a dominant political party. And for example, uh, Malaysia and Singapore. It is a typical of authoritarian regime that all three powers are appointed, appointed by the same political party. Why is Japan is different? So uh, I believe uh, two factors are uh, key to unlock such a paradox. The first is that an uh, uh, extra constitutional appointment convention existing regarding the Supreme Court justice appointment. The justices are not in effect chosen by the cabinet, but by the judicial branch organization or uh, bar associations and the prosecutor's office. So and that's, uh, Therefore, the, some justices uh, have a different ideology uh, from the LDP. For example, especially maybe a famous uh, Tokuji uh, Izumi or uh, uh, Katsumi Chiba, I, I, I introduce you, uh, is a famous uh, uh, judges. Even they are promoted from the judicial organization. They have a liberal and progressive viewpoint. And second, second is a strategy of a Supreme Court has created a political situation where maintaining the appointment convention is good for LDP rather than over time. So uh, there are very um, a complex game. And so a court, court uh, calculate benefit and cost, and also LDP uh, calculated uh, uh, benefit and the cost to keeping the appointment practice and over over time appointment practice. So in in order to balance and uh, Japanese court, uh, Supreme Court um, uh, uh, making a decision so, with uh, strategic viewpoint. So uh, the, these factors suppress the LDP's growth. Uh, I can I call this strategy a strategic political process review. So the strategic political process review has two characteristics. The first is that the court varies the method of review in different areas, and is especially the court makes differential judgment in the area of national security, so-called Article 9 problem, and also economic freedom. On the other hand, uh, it conducts strict scrutiny in the area of freedom of expression and the right to vote or malapportionment policy. Uh, second, even in, even in area of strict scrutiny, the court uses strategic approach. For example, in freedom of expression cases, although the statute is not unconstitutional, uh, courts make uh, constitutional limits. Um, 
in the uh, reasoning of the decision. And also um, in the uh, mal apportionment cases, the method of dialogical judicial review uh, has been adopted. So especially court, court has skillfully interacted with the LDP develop the concept between the unconstitutional and the constitutional. So this, it is very difficult to translate it. So Japanese uh, say jotai, 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 jotai is concept. Yeah, I, I always wondering how to translate this state or uh, state or situation or, uh, but uh, interestingly, there is a famous constitutional doctrine in, in Colombia, unconstitutional state affairs. So, it, but this is a very different concept. Uh, Japanese, Japanese um, so maybe I can say this uh, unconstitutional jota. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, unconstitutional jota is a, a middle way of the unconstitution and the constitution. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, constitutional scholars were critical of the half baked concept of unconstitutional jota. But the reality is that uh, this graph I show you the uh, the court can uh, achieve the uh, achieve to uh, the moral apportionment amendment to the LDP. So uh, the just so there are just two cases unconstitutional case, but but the uh, uh, Supreme Court used many times unconstitutional situation or unconstitutional Jordan. And by this, uh, the uh, LDP uh, change or keep the um, uh, uh, apportionment disparity. Uh, so uh, actually, the, uh, the especially uh, the House of Councillor, it is uh, uh, upper house, the drastically changed. And also it is uh, immediately can recognize the uh, uh, changing, but, but uh, uh, it is a, uh, uh, we, we can look like same, but the House of Representatives uh, um, election system are drastically changed to keeping the uh, this uh, the lower rate to of the uh, moral apportionment. So, yeah. So this is uh, one of the successful of the Japanese Supreme Court. So and finally, uh, so uh, this approach of strategic digital review has some similarity to the political process theory uh, presented by the famous constitutional scholar John Hart E. Uh, however, I believe that this is for political political, but but rather than normative or political reason. Uh, freedom of expression and the right to vote are important to democracy. And hence, the protection of this right is likely to attract public support and pre prevent counterattack from the LDP. On the other hand, national security and economic policy and social economic policy tend to divide the public, and the public may not necessarily support a court decision. In the end, it can be said the strong approach to the political process is because it is an area where counter attacks from LDP can be best prevent prevented. On the other hand, I, I believe that the Japanese Supreme Court does not examine the protection of minority rights uh, as strictly as the original process theory. Even when it decided a uh, case is unconstitutional, it takes uh, much longer to reach such a conclusion. It once, Supreme Court once ruled statute restricting the right of illegitimate children and the transgender people as constitutional. Uh, but finally, they can change the uh, pre constitutional president, but, but president, but it, it took uh, much longer. I think this comes from the fact the protection of minority rights inherently in a conflict with the majority viewpoint. The Supreme Court avoided declaration of minority protection unconstitutional until they are confident that majority will uphold that protection. It is difficult to justify normatively, but there is an element of strategic justification. Overall, uh, Japanese courts have made a compromise to the LDP in areas such as national security, the economy, and minority rights. 
while making no concession in the area, uh, a little concession uh, important to democracy, such as freedom of expression and right to vote and uh, moral portion. And uh, this tactics uh, bargain uh, has restrained the further strengthening of LDP and also maintains the independence of the judiciary of Japan. Thank you so much. Well, that was so um, interesting. I have a lot of questions about the general theory, but I thought I would just start with a couple of questions just to clarify yeah. in more factual detail what these cases involve. So when we're talking about cases involving minorities in the United States, the most important cases that really defined um, the 20th century court were racial minorities. Yes, yeah. But you're not dealing really with racial minorities or ethnic minorities in Japan. Who are the minorities that the court might try to protect with a sort of Jotai constitutional, um, unconstitutional state opinion? Oh, oh thank you so much. So in Japan, uh, there are few uh, racial cases. So, but the national, uh, the, uh, the nationality is one of the very uh, complex uh, topic in Japan. So in Japan, uh, there are many uh, Korean origin people, uh, but they are keeping nationality uh, uh, of the South Korea or North Korea. So uh, Japanese, so, and for example, the nationality of the South uh, Korean people cannot promote to the high ranking uh, uh, or uh, public official. So uh, there are some uh, uh, dispute about, uh, about this. But however, unfortunately, uh, all, almost all cases, uh, the Japanese Supreme Court struck uh, uh, the uh, rejects uh, uh, appeal of the uh, uh, South Korean origin I people. Okay. The the based on the reason is national na the the difference of nationality is um, uh, is important. But however, I think uh, Japanese Supreme Court. Uh, I I I don't know the case, but but in Japanese uh, legal system, it is not permitted. Uh, the uh, discrimination or uh, based on the origin of national origin. Okay. So, so Jap uh, if if uh, Korean people change their nationality to Jap Japanese, uh, so it is not permissible uh, to discriminate. Do lots of cases arise where you have Japanese citizens of Korean ethnicity yeah. filing lawsuits claiming discrimination? And if so, what is the result? Oh, ja oh, Japan, Japanese, Korean, Japanese, Japanese citizen, but a Korean origin. Oh, okay. I'm not sure the case, but but the, I I think uh, formally uh, uh, such discrimi discrimination itself is uh, not mean, not permissible. Yeah. There is no. But such it still way. can happen. Yeah, still. Uh, yeah, I yeah, mean, say, formally, yeah, yeah, um, anti-black discrimination was yeah. forbidden in the United States, but yeah. it happened all the time. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. but, but I think the legal, but but I think de, de, facto, de facto discrimination is maybe there. Oh. I I uh, I remember the case for the private. There are many private cases. Maybe the in the private, for example, the golf club discriminates the people of the uh, maybe Japanese or uh, the South Korean origin people. But but I think this is uh, I'm not, I I need to research. But it is uh, uh, the Supreme Court admits uh, discrimination. That's uh, that's not admit uh, discrimination. But those aren't very common cases yeah, before yeah. the Supreme Court. Yeah. Which minorities are the kinds of minorities yeah. that the court might try to protect? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, ja uh, Korea, Japanese Supreme Court clearly said the uh, based on the dis uh, discrimination based on the uh, element of uh, not uh, the person cannot change their uh, effort or their intention. So uh, such a discrimination is uh, a highest scrutiny. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, illegitimate child is uh, a typical example. So uh, the children cannot change this status, illegitimate or legitimate. So uh, Supreme Court struck down two cases based on the uh, um, uh, illegitimate uh, children. So, um, but, but however, uh, initially they, they are 
and uh, support such uh, legislation. So it 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 may it needed uh, twenty or thirty years to change the constitution. Of course. Oh, well. And now with malapportionment, yeah, yeah. again, just a question of clarification. Yeah. Um, how does the, uh, I assume that if there's any malapportionment, it's for the benefit of the LDP. Yeah. Um, where does the malapportionment take place? In the United States, yeah. malapportionment often benefited rural voters, farmers. Yeah, yeah. What's the story in Japan? Who's, the, who's benefiting from malapportionment and um, which groups are threatened when the court tries to limit malapportionment? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly the same. In Japan, the rural areas, the people are ben get, got to benefit from the malapportionment. And also, uh, the traditional supporter of LDP are com uh, coming from the, the rural area. So the farmers, the officials, and uh, they are support the um, LDP. And also, LDP's uh, strong leaders uh, came from the rural area. So because, so uh, our rural um, uh, politicians uh, sometimes lose the election. So it, the, the uh, urban people change mind and always. And, but however, uh, the, uh, the rural uh, areas people uh, strong support and not change. And also they uh, tend to be a conservative uh, uh, ideology. Mm -hmm. and, uh, now, has it ever been the case that the LDP's yeah. power yeah. was actually threatened by the court's demands that um, population of diet districts be more equal? Because I could see that the LDP might get a super majority if they could get a lot of seats out of underpopulated yeah. rural areas. But I could also see that if the court said, oh, you know, you really have to reduce some of these disparities, and the LDP did so, the LDP might not be threatened because they have so many votes that they can afford to let a little more. It, how threatening is the court's um, Jotai decisions um, to the LDP's actual control of power? I see. So you may, so how to the constitutions Jodai, unconstitutional Jodai, uh, affect the LDP. Practically, practically speaking. Right. If I were an LDP politician, yeah, yeah. I might think I will look very good yeah. if the court strikes down yeah. some ridiculous malapportionment where five farmers yeah. get to elect yeah. a member to the diet. Yeah. But it won't really affect me because I know that I have enough votes even without that malapportionment. So yeah. I'm just curious, how threatening is this to the LDP? I see, I see. So I I need to uh add, I I I needed to add uh, uh, this topic. So but uh, Japanese election system are a little bit complex. So uh, the for example, uh, under house adopts uh, two system, uh, proportionality proportionality election and also district based election. So a proportionality election is based on the uh, uh, population. So um. So LDP need, need to uh, uh, need to look at both uh, electoral system. So if, if LDP continue to keep apportionment, it is possible they lose uh, uh, proportionality, uh, proportional uh, election system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also, yeah, or it's yeah. a two stage, yeah, yeah. two stage, yeah. Yeah, maybe uh, I, I, Japanese Japanese system wrong. From the, Does the yeah. LDP dominate the list part? Yeah, list. list. I mean the the, the non geographically districted part. Yeah, yeah. No, also LDP, but, but sometimes the same. It is interesting. Same and sometimes the uh, non LDP party uh, got uh, uh, more seats of the uh, proportionality. I see. Uh, yeah. I see. But, but LDP is strong uh, district system. Okay. That, that's because uh, one of the reasons are portion. I see. So it actually is a real threat yeah, to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Um, I had one last question, which is you mentioned that the Bar Association yeah. and the bench yeah. of the court yeah. each have nominations to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Would you, how would you characterize the politics of the Japanese Bar compared to the LDP yeah. um, as lawyers? Um, they are, I suppose, some of them are more liberal, some of them are more conservative. 
How would that compare to the members of the LDP? I imagine there's a range of opinions in the LDP. Some are more liberal, some are more conservative. So how, do the, how does the bar compare? I would say just in the United States, the bar is fairly left of center, I think, compared to, say, the Republican Party, um, which has been in power for a while. Um, yeah, I think uh, Japanese, uh, the LDP thought thinking uh, the, the bar association is left, left uh, relatively left, but, but recently it changed, changed the uh, appointment. So, uh, the, uh, the, so before the, the, the uh, candidate from the bar association, uh, a more left uh, or, or, or uh, the, the lawyer who are engaged in the civil activity or uh, civil, ac civil activity and uh, it tend to be left. But recently, the appointed of judges, uh, appointed as judges from the bar association is uh, uh, come from the, uh, the big, firm, big, big law firm. Uh, group on. but, but uh, the so LDP thought maybe or our uh, Supreme Court also think uh, the the big law firms uh, uh, law firms uh, attorney is relatively conservative they thought but however this is uh, not 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 the case the the, the, the big law firm uh, judges rights are uh, uh, very progressive uh, and. Uh, like progress uh, uh, opinion at the court. Well, yeah. That's great. That sounds yeah. like woke yeah, capitalism. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. Yeah, capital. They are capitalism, but, but uh, yeah. also. Pro, pro. Well, th those are my main questions, just yeah. to give a picture, a fuller picture of, of how the system works. Sam, these are right in your real yeah. house. We got malapportionment. We got judicial review in a delicate situation. Um, what do you think of this um, very inter these interesting findings? So. Um, let me preface my comment by saying that we're going to have a mismatch here between the richness of the paper and the poverty of my knowledge of Japan. And so we're, we're dealing in an unfair uh, playing field here. But um, so my reactions go across three different levels. And the first one is um, uh, I love the way that you set this up as a central paradox of why one party rule does not yield uh, more authoritarian systems. And uh, certainly if you compare this as you do in your paper to uh, countries like uh, Taiwan, uh, Malaysia, you see that uh, there is no prospect of real social liberalism, political liberalism, or uh, even a role for the judiciary until you get political competition. So until the woman down lost its, its control and the inflation, similar process, you really didn't have space for constitutional review. And so you're trying to figure out, as I read it, the paradox of why this is so. And, and we've talked about this in my office. And it's, it's really kind of a, a you know, perplexing. Um, and your hypothesis is that the court plays a more important role than it's given credit for, because you know the standard story is oh, the Japanese court's not interesting. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't strike down. It doesn't have famous cases like Brown v. Board or something like that. And you're saying that's not so. It's it's a more important actor than it's given credit for. Um, and I I accept that. I I, I think that that's persuasive. Um, and uh, to give an example of that. Um, during the uh, post-September uh, 11th period in the United States, there's a lot of retrospection about how do we handle national security cases here? And the most famous uh, 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 exposition on that was by our former Chief Justice, William Rehnquist, who wrote a book saying, it was titled, All the Laws But One. That is, that the court just doesn't review the national security stuff. And Rick Pildes and I wrote a paper, uh, a couple of papers, but the, the, the main thrust was uh, this is wrong because what the constitutional scholars and what Rehnquist did was they looked for blockbuster constitutional cases. But in fact, the way that the US Supreme Court handled it was as a matter of statutory interpretation of whether there was a sufficient delegation of authority by Congress to the president. So it looked subconstitutional, but this is in some sense first order constitutionalism. 
And when I presented this once uh, in England, uh, the commentator, Chris McCrudden, very, very fine constitutional lawyer in, in, in uh, the UK, said, you're describing the English system. Because before the, the creation of the UK Supreme Court, when you still had the House of Lords system, uh, formally there was no judicial review. He said, but what we do in the UK is the court reviews the executive conduct and determines whether or not it's ultra virus. And using the concept of ultra virus was a substitute for the constitutionality of it. And I think that what, what I read into your paper is that the Japanese court uses similar techniques in many, many areas of law to constrain the uh, LDP from going too far. And that's fascinating. And, and I think that that's, um, you know, I, I'm persuaded by that. Then you go a next step. And here I have a little, a little more trouble. You say, well, this is evidence of strategic behavior. And you cite my paper and that of my student, Aaron Delaney, and that of my student, Sergio Verdugo. So I'm, I'm, I'm implicated uh, in, this, uh, in this approach. I'm not sure I was persuaded that it's behaving strategically because strategically, to, for my thinking of a court behaving strategically is acting inconsistent with where judicial practice and doctrine would have taken. And the table that you have on page 21, which I reproduced up there, seems to indicate pretty principled decision-making by the, by the Supreme Court. If you're able to it, and again, I don't know the cases, I'm relying on your representation. The cases seem to fall into patterns in which doctrine and approach are stable. And if that's so, that doesn't seem strategic. Well, what we understand by strategic is always uh, sub silencio. It's under the table. It's not stated. But the methodology seems, at least on your telling, quite transparent. And so I'm not sure why that becomes. Uh, it, it's not clear to me why this is strategic. And in fact, when you get to, um, you know, the comparison to Ely and the stuff that Rick and I, Rick Pellis and I do on, you know, the application of Ely to process theory to uh, uh, questions of, of uh, the political order itself, when you get there, it seems that the court has a theory and it's, and, the, and if you're right, it's not that it's occulted, it's not that it's hidden, it's that it's right out front for the LDP to say, you mess around in this area and this is where we will assert ourselves. Um, so that's so I, I, that's my second point, which is I, I, I'm I, I I'm not entirely sure what you gain by calling this strategic behavior as opposed to wise behavior as opposed to uh, something of that sort. And you're you're influenced by a literature uh, from social science on uh, judicial behavior, judicial decision making, which I find um, uh, on a good day problematic and on a bad day, silly, uh, some of that literature, because uh, what they do in the United States application is they say, okay, here are the justices of the Supreme Court or lower courts. Here's the party that appointed them. I'm going to run correlations and show that they always come out this way. And then when I press them in the conference, I say, how do you explain that the two thirds of the cases of the Supreme Court are unanimous? They say, well, we remove unanimous cases from the data set. I said, well, that's a hell of a methodology. No. And my in, in, in one piece, I, wrote, I said, that's like if we came from Mars and observed human beings only in boxing rings, we'd say that humans are extremely pugilistic, but we that would exclude all other categories of activity. And so it, it doesn't, if you're trying to get a sense of the institutional role of the court, um, you have to you, you have to earn the, the claim of strategic behavior. Now that leads to the third third final point, which I think is really what is underlying your paper. And it's too big a point for you to develop here, but it's 
it's I just finished reading uh, Gary Bass's book on the Tokyo trials and his projections of how that sort of pre-configured uh, Japanese political behavior for the uh, for the entire post-war period. Um, you're you're trying to get ultimately at why is Japan not uh, Singapore? Or why is Japan not uh, Malaysia or uh, Thailand's more complicated? But, you know, any country where you have a single dominant party and political competition doesn't really constrain it the way that uh, Democrat theory, uh, Schumpeterian approaches uh, predict. And so you want to look for an external actor. And, you know, we have... Uh, uh, yesterday, we had uh, here a visiting delegation of Israeli uh, officials who were talking about the importance of protecting the court because you don't have bicameralism in Israel, you don't have federalism, you don't have this. So, you, the only, and you have just proportional representation creating a prime minister. And so, political coalition is all powerful. Uh, and so, their view was the court has been the only institution. Uh, that has protected against what we're seeing now in, in the uh, consolidation of a very uh, problematic foreign political power. And you're trying to ask, why doesn't that happen? Why, why in Japan? And your, your intuition is, it's got to be the court, because it's the only vibrant institution that is independent of the LDP, even if as a formal matter, this is quite fascinating, as a formal matter, it's all appointed by the LDP. It's all internal to the same political processes, but somehow it has a sense of independence. And I, I want to just throw out some other variables uh, out there. Um, a few years back, uh, we had uh, a constitutional our constitutional uh, colloquium here that Rick Pildes and myself and Pasquale Pasquino uh, ran. And we had Dieter Grimm come. He was still on the uh, German constitutional court. And the students were pressing him on a number of opinions by the German court that seemed strategic, that seemed. And Dieter's answer to every question was, you have to understand Hitler and this. And we went to dinner afterwards and I said, Dieter, I've never heard anyone invoke Hitler so many times <laughs> in, in, in polite discourse. <laughs> and his answer was, if you don't understand the response to Nazis as the organizing feature of uh, post-World War II, West Germany, then Germany, you don't understand the core of our jurisprudence. And so everything has to relate back. So having just read Gary Bass's book, one of the questions is to what extent is uh, there a legacy of the reaction to the militarism uh, pre-1945? And uh, does that continue to weigh on us? A second question would be, for example, that in each of the countries that you, we use as comparisons, uh, whether Taiwan uh, in the Kuomintang period or Malaysia, uh, or even Singapore, Singapore's a little bit, little bit uh, uh, skewed here. Um, the, mil the lack of political competition is coupled with the central role of the military as an ally of the single party. And so, and that's indispensable and gives the, gives the single party, yes, we have elections, you can vote for us, but here's my friend, General So-and-so, who will come and take over if you, if, if you mess with us. Anyway, Japan doesn't have that. And it, obviously this is a very big issue and has been for a long time in Japan, you know, rearming and you know, how, to, uh, how to engage with China if the US is not going to uh, play this role. Um, it, it's uh, the absence of the military as an institution seems more central than your story would allow and also keeps the LDP from being tempted to go to break the democratic barriers. So uh, on the first part, you had me completely. On the strategic part, I, I, I thought that the court was seemed on your telling behaving more, more judicially honorably than, than you 
wanted to give it credit for. And on the ultimate story of it must be the court, I, I don't know how many other confounding cultural and historical and institutional factors may say that maybe the court is not, you know, the Israelis make a very good claim that it is the court, but we've seen the confrontations there. Japan, I'm not so sure. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. So your final point, sir. Yes, uh, the army and LDP is, uh, yes, a um, good point, I think. Maybe uh, article, I think uh, article nine is uh, critical to uh, restrain the LDP power. So actually there is a, a military force organization in Japan, but always this based on such uh, the military uh, base, uh, base of the military, a uh, military is always a uh, question as uh, always be questioned as uh, constitutional. So, for example, if uh, actually uh, Japan uh, engage in the Iraq war or other uh, Afghanistan, war, uh, but uh, always uh, rose sweet invo was invoked to in it in constitutionality of this. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, the the uh, court uh, differ the uh, uh, this situation to the diet diet or uh, uh, executive branch, but however there are always dispute uh, uh, under uh, the civil civil law, uh, civil uh, civil society, and also uh, it is difficult to uh, LD, even LDP to uh, uh, exp expand the the military. So uh, and. Yes, uh, and also Article Nine has a uh, uh, regent or post uh, the the Japanese war uh, uh, experience during World War Two, and all, also uh, uh, yes, uh, even now some Japanese think the uh, strong power, strong power or strong military power is dangerous for the uh, democracy or civil society. Of course, uh, yes, this legend is important. Uh, but, but however, uh, the uh, 20, 20, uh, uh, 2010, and uh, uh, for example, uh, after 2010, the uh, Abe's uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe is uh, one of the strong, strongest supporter of the change, such regime of the change ideology. Mm -hmm. And he is uh, strongly committed to the uh, uh, re reorganization of the military and uh, change the, the legend. So one of the, his slogan is uh, uh, change the change change the post war regime. Uh, and but however, uh, he couldn't uh, finally uh, change the Japanese such legend. Yeah, despite having strong yeah. popular support. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Very yeah. powerful prime minister. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But despite yeah, despite. So and also uh, also uh, one of the reason is uh, legend of the people and uh, legend of the uh, World War Two and also the uh, in Japan there are huge uh, 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 systematic or uh, structured bureaucratic system and so even the um, prime minister or LDP cannot change the change mind or structure of the Japanese bureaucratic system. But they, they try to do uh, are partially uh, uh, successful, yeah, but uh, com they cannot change the completely the, the such bureaucratic system. I think Japanese traditional bureaucratic system uh, uh, also supports uh, uh, suppress LDP strength. Thing. So LDP, even LDP politicians need uh, a help of the uh, Japanese bureaucracy, yeah. and also yeah, and also the the first question may, maybe for me it is very critical <laughs> critical for articles. So you you means uh, my yeah uh, the my my scheme is uh, not not just for the strategic but but just only the uh, uh, doctoral doctrine or yeah theoretically uh, yeah would. Would most yeah. Japanese constitutional scholars accept your table? Oh yeah, maybe I think yeah, yeah maybe this table is support maybe this supported by his uh, Japanese uh, professor uh, not only professor but also the uh, practitioner. We call this uh, uh, 
double standard, double standard. So economic, economic problem uh, court need to differ, uh, differ, and also political uh, uh, in the field or political um, field is the uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, engage in the strict review. Yeah, and yeah, this is uh yes uh clear, but but uh I think this is uh academic uh dogmatically it is uh legitimate and also why is so uh, the Supreme Court engaging in such strategy uh st such review I think it is uh their strategic thinking uh, Supreme Court. Okay. You think they sit around yeah and have conversations with each other and say. We can push here, but not here. What? Do you think that they actually sit and talk and, and make a decision? You well, know, they, we think about strategic behavior, we think of conspiracy. Yeah, I see, I see. I see. in the back room or in a tea house somewhere, yeah. and they say, you know what? We got to oh, push yeah. hard on this, but we can't do that. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yes, it's critical. So it is difficult to prove. Uh, it is difficult to prove. <laughs> that, that just, just only uh, observe the outside. Outside and I, I get just guess. Can I make a clarifying and then I want to open it up, but I do want to clarify this question of what it means to be strategic. Yes. In formal economic terms, a strategic behavior is a any behavior motivated by anticipated reaction. It uh, could be overt in an opinion. So this is strategic behavior. Yeah. Imagine I wrote a judicial opinion and said, we would like to enjoin the Vietnam War. We think the Vietnam War is unconstitutional, but we anticipate that the military will disobey us, and therefore we won't enjoin the Vietnam War. Now that's overt, it's in the opinion, but it's strategic in the sense that we're saying, we are writing our opinion based upon the anticipated response of somebody else. That's what makes strategic behavior game theoretic. Um, some US doctrines like the political question doctrine sometimes bake in the anticipated response of the other branches. So in the United States, our political question doctrine says something like, well, um, would there be embarrassment if the other branches didn't actually obey us? And that will be written in the judicial opinion. That is, that fails um, Sam's test for strategic in the sense that it's hidden, it's overt, but it is strategic in the sense that it takes into account the anticipated response of another actor. And I think what you're saying is, these decisions are strategic in the sense that they take into account the anticipated reactions of another actor. Is that accurate? also, but they're also not stated. I mean, there there is this other mm -hmm. component, this quasi conspiratorial. Yeah, because you're dealing with a multi member body, and how does a multi member body mm -hmm. engage in strategic behavior? Yeah. There has to be some coordination. And if you say it's on the face of the opinion, that's fine. That's yeah. open. But that's not where it usually takes place. And I think it doesn't usually take place here precisely because it's embarrassing to the legal mind um, to engage in game theoretic strategy. Because it means you're saying we're altering our behavior in response to the anticipated response of yeah. Thomas Jefferson, who won't actually give Marbury his commission or whoever. So I, I think it's, uh, it's really illuminating to think, oh, by definition, the game theoretic idea of strategy requires deception. So, so the article from that Ross Dixon and I wrote, that, that uh, has an impact here, uh, says, if you look around the world, what you find is that the opinions that announce judicial review are always opinions with government wins. Yes. And so, uh, like Marburg, and right. we call it the Marburg strategy, that you, uh, you say the government wins, but by the way, we have plenary review, we have all the power, we could have struck it down yeah. if we thought so. They win but, because we say they win. Yeah, but we don't, but of course we don't have to here because the government did right. Now that's strategic in my view because they are really deciding the next case without saying it. Yeah. And they are setting up the discussion for the next time. So I, I don't differ from Rick's definition of one step anticipating the next, but when you're dealing with multi-member bodies, and especially with the court, which has a tradition of seemingly transparent written opinions, I think the the you have to have an account of how they coordinate uh, on this uh, on this behavior. Now, what I love about this so far is two people, neither of whom speak Japanese or know much about Japan, have been commenting on your paper. But there's only one person in this room, um, my colleague Bruce Aronson, who actually. A, understands Japanese law and has worked in Japan. 
So Bruce, I'm really curious about what you think about this. Paper. Well, I have a uh, few comments. The first one is, do we think of Supreme Court justices as acting based on their individual consciousness and they have to have big discussions in order to make a decision? I think that most of our view of Japan, even people who have opposing views, like perhaps in your Japanese about what's going on, they agree that the judiciary is extremely well organized based on Supreme Court Secretariat and Supreme Court research people who are not clerks. They're all elite mid-career judges, 30 of them or so, and uh, 15 Supreme Court justices. If you ever visit in the Supreme Court justices, they're what we call salary men. Um, they stick to what they're told to do. They're very busy. Uh, Japanese emperor is probably one too, I suppose, compared to the UK where Queen Elizabeth and family owned $24 billion worth of real estate and Japanese imperial family owns nothing. So we're all kind of um, <clears throat> workers, I suppose. Um, and so the judges are career judges, very highly trained and professional. Um, and so everyone agrees who looks at Japan, um, that the General Secretary of the Supreme Court is extremely powerful, and that's the institution that counts. When we talk about judicial independence, we usually don't talk about individual judges writing based on their own conscience. We generally talk about the judiciary as an institution being independent from the OBP. And the debate is, so Ramsayer would say, he finds agents everywhere. He would say that the judges are simply agents of the OBP. And, and the agency is um, carried out through the general secretary of the bureaucracy. And John Haley would say, um, no. Um, this all happens because the general secretary is so strong and the judges are so well professionally trained career judges that it's really a form of socialization. They instinctively stick up for the judiciary as an institution, not individual judges running around signing things based on their consciousness. Um, and so one of my suggestions, actually, while seeing this paper would be um, for your very basic point that it's not simply conservatism, would be to cite um, certainly Haley, who talks about the judiciary as an institution and socialization of judges. That's the interest, not individual ideology or individual consciousness. I think that um, would tend to uh, support your argument. And although it's not part of your paper, in addition to the image of Japanese judges being conservative, as you know, that's really on the public law, public policy, political questions side. On the private law side, as people look at Japan come away with a different response, it's not part of your paper, but judges can be quite activist. Um, some of the laws that were imposed by the US during the occupation, for example, they have at-will employment, but they don't have at-will employment because judges have consistently said you need costs. I mean, going directly against the black letter. Um, and we could have debates about what the purpose of that is. Maybe it's to uh, encourage long-term stable relationships activism and the cause of stability, one heard of the way what was called. Uh, that's not a central part of your paper. Um, but if the premise is it's not really a story simply about conservatism, that also might be at least worth a footnote. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yes, I, I think I, I need to more good for clarify the uh, concept of the conservative. Well, also, yeah. what do we, you, you mentioned it briefly. So the two questions I always ask my class, which you were kind enough to join and provide some good comments on, what do we mean by judicial independence? Oh, is it yeah. individual consciousness or is it the judiciary as an institution? That's a big distinction in Japan, I think. So what do we mean by judicial independence and what do we mean by being conservative? I mean, conservative could be a lot of things too. It could be ideological, which most people say it's not in Japan. Um, it could be as you described it in certain instances. I mean, the Article 9 decisions and only 12 cases that declare a statute unconstitutional are the regions we have an image of Japanese judges as being conservative, but 
um, Frank Upham is in Tokyo now, he's not here. He wrote an essay, oh no, the Japanese judges are the best example of the rule of law because they apply the law to the cases. And it's not ideological and political like it can be in the US. So I, I think it's probably worth a footnote to discuss what we mean by conservative, because there's probably three or four different ways you can think of uh, that mean conservative. And um, I think uh, in your article, the idea of judicial independence of being conservative also related, because you're, you're trying to push back against both in a way that uh, some view on Graham's interests, there's no judicial independence in the conservative. And you're basically saying, no, neither of those are true. And there is support in the literature from John Healy and others and looking at the private law cases that would support that a little more strongly. Thank you. It's hard to, to detect strategic behavior in this sense. We need to know whether somebody is writing a decision because they're responding to an anticipated response that they disagree with, or they're writing a decision because they actually have internalized that anticipated response because they're part of the coalition. So I'm curious, Bruce, in, in any, I'm very curious about the coalition that is the LDP, because a political party is never an it, it's a they, it's a group. And I've, if you read Wikipedia, they'll say the LDP is the corporate party, or it's the party of business. Well, business, what is business? Among other things, business is business lawyers, right? Um, and so I imagine that it might very well be the judges are part of the LDP coalition. The kind of people who become big law firm lawyers, become a judge, are the kind of professional or bureaucratically inculcated people that are also salarymen. It's not that different to rise to a corporation and to rise to the judiciary. They're both big organizations. Is that true? Or am I just making this stuff up? I mean, I'm definitely making it up, but it could be true. Well, they're all salarymen. I think that's true. Yeah. yeah. Keeping it to, to your, the scope of your paper. I think that taking Bruce's comments, the paradox is that you have this liberal democratic order itself. You have civil liberties, you have contested elections, despite that you have one part. And uh, if your argument is that the court has a big role in influence in that contra the way that the court is generally perceived, um, you know, the, the main evidence that's cited is the, the Japanese Supreme Court has been struck down this X number of times. Is it 12? No, 12 times. Well, you know, you can have a policeman who walks around the village here with a gun and in his entire career never took the gun out and fired it. And so one conclusion is that the gun is irrelevant. Uh, another conclusion is that <laughs> it's pretty important. He's got a gun. He's got a gun, you know. And um, uh, and I think that that's what you're dealing what you're dealing with here. The fact that it could do it until you have to recall in the United States until the 1990s, the number of times that the Supreme Court had struck down an act of Congress, you could count on two hands, and. Now we, we see it all the time because we have a different relationship between the branches. But that doesn't mean that the power was there. And it doesn't mean that it couldn't be exercised, as I said earlier, through creative statutory interpretation, which is warning you've gone too far now. And so I think that that's, you know, that, that that's what you're pushing at is this idea that it's a, it's a more critical actor than a simple account of only 12 cases would yield. We're actually at the end of our hour right now. Um, so um, although I think there's a lot left to say, um, I'm going to thank very much um, your, your presenting this fascinating paper to us and explaining the Japanese system or trying to get under what the Japanese system is about to us. And thanks a lot, Sam, for coming with your comments and um, ideas and Bruce for filling us in on what might actually be going on. So to be continued out of this room, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.